Welcome to another MBS Highway live monthly webinar. I'm one of your hosts, Megan Anderson, along with Dan and Barry Habib. And today's guest, well, he is the Chief Investment Officer and Chief U.S. Equity Strategist for Morgan Stanley, where he's responsible for all investment and asset allocation advice provided to the firm's four trillion in retail client assets. And over the past 30 years, well, he's held various roles with increasing responsibilities. He started his career back in 1989 with investment banking before transitioning to institutional equities division in 1995 where Mike created and managed the sector specialist team. And then in 2009, while well, he became head of content distribution for North America. And today you will find him regularly on CNBC and Bloomberg. He's often quoted in popular financial publications such as Barron's and the Wall Street Journal and The Economist. And without further ado, join me in welcoming Mike Wilson. <laughs> We're so glad to have you, Mike. Um, just uh, I'll, I'll kind of embarrass you just a little bit here. So I, I know we have some very mutual friends that are very dear to us, you know, Lacey Hunt and David Rosenberg and Peter Bookbar. So I, I had them at a, at a conference, a Momentum Builder conference that we were all speaking at. We're at dinner and your name came up several times and you were your name was followed by or uh, the prefix was the best analyst on Wall Street. So, uh, but you, you, there's a lot of love your way. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Barry. And thanks, Megan, for that uh, introduction. Um, it's great to be with you and, and uh, the folks here today. Um, I would challenge the view uh, now, I think I'm probably one of the more hated uh, people. So, uh, this disrespected, uh, maybe rightly so, given how the markets have traded this year so far. But, um, but let's get into it. I'm happy to talk about whatever you'd like to get into. You, you, you know, um, Mike, it's funny that you say that. And I think and, and last time you and I spoke, and I love that we get a chance to catch up uh, periodically, is that we feel a little bit like um, in the movie, The Big Short, where, you know, you had uh, either uh, Mike Burry, who was played by Christian Bale, or uh, Steve Eisman, played by Steve Carell, where they they thought they were right, they believed they were right, but things just didn't pan out for a while, but eventually they were proven right. And boy, oh boy, I know that Lacey feels the same way and Rosie feels the same way. And, you know, Dan, Megan, Diana, and I, we, all, we all feel the same way because you know, we were anticipating that, at least from the, the, the bond side, that we'd see more of those fundamentals. So I guess my first question to you is, we've seen a pretty big drop in inflation. And normally, you would see the bond market respond well. But if you take yesterday, for example, bonds sold off after a very nice inflation number. Um, what is going on, in your opinion, behind the scenes that's causing something like this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, well, first of all, before I get to the bond market, I would say, you know, what's interesting in the, in the stock market, uh, you know, the fundamental view that we've had all year has actually played out. You know, earnings have generally disappointed in line with what we've been forecasting. We're in an earnings recession. And I think that the deviation now is that um, the majority of equity investors are starting to believe that, that that's as bad as it's going to get. And that's where we really, our view differ, is different than most equity folks now, which is we think the earnings recession is going to get worse and not actually bottom out in the second quarter. Um, the bond market should, as you rightly point out, probably should like that too, right? The bond market should probably be rallying on the idea that growth is, you know, been disappointing, at least at the earnings level. Now, Maybe the bond market's keying off the stronger than expected economic data. We've been kind of things have been holding up a little bit better, perhaps, than what we would have thought. I'll come back to that in a minute. But specifically to yesterday on the inflation news, um, I mean, it was it was good, but I wouldn't say. I mean, we're still not at target. Um, I mean, it does it does give the Fed the latitude to you know maybe hike today. I doubt it, but at least leave the door open to further hikes if necessary. So maybe there was a little bit more priced into the bond market for a weaker CPI than what we got yesterday. Even though it was soft, uh, particularly in the services side, maybe the bond market was expecting something different. So there's always that nuance, which is just hard to know. And the other thing I would throw out there, though, is that you know the Treasury issuance, which you know we've been talking about a lot, that you know we have to basically issue a bunch of paper uh, because it hadn't been in the marketplace because of the debt ceiling. That's now been lifted. 
So they're going to be in the marketplace pretty aggressively. And there was a rather sizable bond auction, as you know, this week, um, not just in bills. And that may have added to some of the supply. So I think there's a lot of things. I mean, look, it's not like rates are, you know, four and a quarter again, right? I mean, we're, we're bouncing between 360 and 380. Okay, fine. I mean, it's just doing nothing. Uh, and it, but, but it's clearly not pricing in a recession. And it's not pricing in, you know, uh, inflation going back towards target. I mean, I, I don't think we're there yet. The last thing, you know, I would say, just because I want to come back to it again, maybe later in the conversation, which is, I think there's an underappreciation from folks who I talk to anyways, around how much fiscal stimulus there has been over the last 12 months. And I'll just give you some round numbers, but we, uh, we look at the increase in the fiscal deficit over, you know, starting in July of last year through basically June of this year. So, you know, trailing 12 months, we think there's been an incremental $1 trillion in government spending. That's a 4% impulse to GDP, you know, and I think some of that is keeping, you know, some of the data better on the economic front and maybe the bond market is kind of keying off of that, that there's more gas in the tank still to kind of keep us going for at least a few more quarters, if not longer. Well, where do you think the, where do you think the inflection point will be? That's, is, is it that we see inflation actually decrease? Is it that we see a crack in the job market finally? Because there's a lot of things that would lead you to believe that the job market is nowhere near as strong as uh, what people are, are talking about. Um, where do you think that, that crack appears first? Well, I mean, as you as you know, when these cycles play out, it's it's you know gradually, then suddenly, right? So I think we have a, a lot of evidence that it's happening gradually. Uh, we have hours worked down significantly. We have a this divergence between the household survey and the and the you know the traditional payroll numbers, which is widely divergent. Um, just to put that number out there, it's negative three hundred thousand jobs from the household survey last month. So, you know, and I don't put a lot of credence in the labor data because it's the most revised data series we have. I mean, they come back and revise this thing. So I don't think we're in a full-blown recession today, but I don't think the labor market's nearly as strong as what the perhaps the data is saying today. And I would, I would, I would gather that in a year from now, it'll probably be revised lower. Um, and maybe it could be a situation like in 08, where in the summer of 08, you probably recall since you brought up the comparison where we're debating on whether or not we are in a recession. I mean, there's still plenty of people who said we're not in a recession. Oil was making new highs, so it was kind of hard to, to assume that. But of course, then we went back and we backdated the recession to the beginning of 2008. So in other words, in August of 08, we'd already been in a recession for eight months. Um, but of course, in the moment, there was this big debate going on whether it was going to be a soft landing you know, or not. And I feel like it's very similar today, not knowing the answer, but suspecting that we're in the midst of the gradual deterioration in these markets that will eventually convince the equity market that there's more earnings risk in what they're pricing. With let, let's talk to to the to the stock market uh, for a moment here. So you know the the stock market has been driven you know by by just a handful of stocks, literally, right? It's a it's a handful of stocks. Uh, history tells us that the catch up there usually is that the handful of stocks catches up to the market as opposed to the market catching up to the handful of stocks. And what do you see happening here? Well, it's actually a really good question because there is evidence, okay? If you go back and look at historically and you're objective and we try to be objective as we can, very bad breath is either the sign of a market top or a market bottom, okay? Um, and you go back and look at all the major, you know, breath collapses, that's what you usually get when the, when the market's crashing kind of at the end of a cycle. Um, there are other instances where, you know, the market gets very narrow and then the average stock catches up to the leaders because the leadership is kind of signaling that things aren't as bad as people fear. So look, nobody knows the future. Um, we're leaning towards the, you know, the case that the, the leaders will catch down. Um, but we have to be open-minded to this, Barry, because I mean, like, look, we didn't expect a trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus a year ago. Okay, we, you know, who knows what the Federal Reserve is going to do with QT if the banking crisis gets worse? Um, I mean, my my suspicion is they'll probably end it quickly. Um, and so we just, I think we have to just be open-minded, and that's what the that's why the equity market is kind of hanging around 
because until the evidence is overwhelming in the positive, it will not price a recession. It just won't happen. It never happens until there's that event that's so overwhelming hits you in the face, the equity market will fight it. And, um, and that's where we are. Is so, that a negative, is that a negative job print? Well, I mean, historically speaking, negative one negative jobs number is, is not been enough. Since so 08, we got negative job prints and we didn't, you know, we hung around until leave it, right? So I, I don't know, it, it can be a combination of things. Um, it can be a liquidity drain, which is what I think it could be in this case, which is so like, let's just think about the next six months, okay? Next six months, Treasury's gonna issue $1.2 trillion roughly in bills and, and some bonds. That will have to be absorbed by somebody that's crowding out. We think reserves in the banking system will go down by a half a trillion dollars, which is you know potentially not great for markets. Then you'll see kind of CTAs and other you know passive strategies follow that, that price momentum the other way. You also have the fiscal headwinds, which is going to reverse in a major fashion over the next six months at a time when we think the earnings picture is gonna deteriorate further. So, so I, you know, I think that, I think what's gonna happen is price will lead um, and then the fundamentals will follow, all right? Um, I don't know if we need a big catastrophic event at the end to wake everybody up. Like, I'll, and I'll give you the last four just because they're instructive and I'm not predicting any of these things, of course, but you know, last recession, it was the COVID lockdowns, okay, obvious. Uh, in 08, it was Lehman and the contagion that created because the way they dealt with Lehman was different than the way they, they, they dealt with the other banks. Okay, fine. Um, in 2001, it was 9 11. Uh, and then in 1990, it was the invasion of Iraq um, by, I'm sorry, uh, invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, which caused this massive spike in, in oil prices. Um, so, what's it going to be this time? I don't know. Hopefully, it won't be life threatening. And it won't be some financial contagion that really takes us to our knees, but but it'll be something. Um, something will kind of jolt the markets in a way where the markets finally say enough. We we can't we can't look through this. So, Mike, you brought up something that's very interesting, and it's it's so funny that you say this. And Dan, you probably remember this. It was a, I don't know it was maybe it was a month ago, and I was kind of like just saying in my mind, you know, what what the Fed's done is they've kind of painted themselves in a corner. So if we do find ourselves where the economy is deteriorating, they might be loath to cut rates because there's, you know, there's some, some things that could happen. If they cut rates by more than 100 basis points, it may impact the dollar. And if the dollar weakens, then oil prices, because we're de denominated in dollars, might move a lot higher. And based upon that, you could be then reintroducing inflation. Okay, so maybe they can't do that. Um, they, they certainly don't want to do QE if they can avoid it. So maybe it's exactly what you said. And I said that to Dan, I said, you know, maybe they stop QT. And I, and I said, Dan, that sounds like maybe it's a good idea. And here I am thinking I'm smart. So I run the idea past a mutual friend of ours, Danielle DiMartino. And she says, yeah, Barry, that would make sense, except that's the sacred cow. She says, if you're in the media and you go into one of these Fed press conferences, and if you even mention stopping QT, they throw you out of the room. So I mean, I think it's a good idea, but do you think the Fed would actually even entertain it? Well, eventually they're going to stop QT, right? I mean, we don't, you know, you know, they'd like to stop it when they feel like they've completed the job, whatever that number is. I don't think they've really even told us exactly where that is, but it's not here. That's this is not a desired level where they want to stop QT. They want to shrink the balance sheet further for sure. Um, my guess is they'll have to stop it because they're forced to at some point. Okay, kind of like in 2019, you know, when they had to reverse because excess reserves got too low. And I think there's a real risk that that happens this year. So right now, I think, I think reserves are 14% of GDP. Um, and, you know, back in the September of 2019, you know, they thought they had plenty of excess reserves. And then, of course, they didn't. And they had to do what I call QE4 at that time. That was when they brought out the reverse repo operation for the first time. And they did basically a trillion dollars of QT in a short period of time, or QE rather. Um, and that extended the, you know, the market cycle for another six or eight months until the COVID hit. Uh, could something like that happen again if reserves get too low for their liking? Yes, um, but we're not there now, right? Reserves are, are plentiful. 
But if we get that five to six hundred billion dollar decline that we're forecasting because of treasury issuance, and oh by the way, uh, money market uh, you know migration continues from deposits, you know we could be at a threshold before year end where they say okay we have to stop QT, and maybe even do QE. I don't know. I mean, but that, that that would be something I think it's worth considering. What one thing I want to talk about real quickly, not, not to leave the topic on inflation, because the, you know, the, and I may be going off script a little bit, which you might think I might say, which is that you know we've been talking about this for a while, but we believe, or I believe, that stocks are now positively correlated to the rate of change on inflation. Okay, it's exactly the opposite of what the last thirty years has brought, and so. Obviously, higher inflation is bad for bonds, so yields will go up. But it, it means that earnings can actually continue to do okay, too, because it means pricing power has not left companies yet. And that's what we've been experiencing this year, right? Rates have gone back up since the you know, regional banking problems. So we've gone from 330 to 380. And you would say to yourself, why? I mean, surprised that you know, multiples are up on that. Well, multiples are up because now the equity market is saying, well, if inflation is going to stay here, that means earnings are going to be okay. And so I can pay a higher multiple because I was assuming lower earnings before. And that's a really, you know, kind of perverse development that I think a lot of people are struggling to deal with. Now, we think, and, and by the way, I think a really important data point today was the PPI. Mm -hmm. So PPI for final demand collapsed. And our work shows that when the PPI Okay, that leads sales growth. So we think this is a leading indicator now for sales growth, which is, which is going to really surprise companies in the second half of this year, meaning pricing power is going to evaporate. And that should be good for bonds. It will be good for bonds. So we're long duration again. We, start, we actually bought more duration last week in our, in our asset allocation uh, book. So, so, for everybody, so for everybody listening, that means you're, you're looking optimistically on things with longer term, like mortgage-backed securities or 10-year treasuries. Correct. We think 10-year treasury yields will come down between now and year end, potentially meaningfully if it's a recession, obviously. And we think there's a still a 50% chance that happens, maybe more. Um, but probably even three and a quarter or 340 if recession doesn't happen. So, you know, we're pretty bullish on the back end. Um, could that allow stocks to levitate further? Normally, I would say yes, but I actually think the answer is no, because now if rates go down to three and a quarter, three percent, that means inflation is probably coming down harder because we're, growth is disappointing. And that will more than outweigh whatever benefit you'd get from a discount rate standpoint. So I want to talk about something that, that that's a, I think it's an interesting thing to, to just get your thoughts on. And that's the Treasury General Account, the TGA. So we know that with all of the antics of the debt ceiling, that that Treasury General Account, which, and forgive me if I'm, if I'm not getting it exactly right, but it wouldn't be unusual to have somewhere around $500 billion in that Treasury General Account or their checking account. That was drained down to somewhere around $40 billion because the um, the the debt ceiling was not resolved, so they drained the general account. Many folks are saying that that was actually pretty stimulative to the stock market. And the fact that now that Treasury general account would have to be replenished may work adversely towards the stock market. Is that is that a view that you share you can add some color to? Yeah, I just, I mean, I, that's kind of what I said before, but I described it differently. I described it as Treasury issuance which it, some of that's being used to pay the bills and some of that's being used to restock their checking account or the treasury general account, same, same idea. Um, so yes, we, we're very much of the view that the restocking of the treasury general account is, think of it this way, it's a crowding out of investment dollars, okay? So in the last six or eight months, the treasury has not been issuing any paper because they couldn't, right? The debt ceiling was, we had hit it. So they were restricted on what they could issue. Um, well, think it, that, that's like a liquidity injection because it means that money that would normally be going to fund the government can just go to do other things. So now you're reversing that and you're basically going to be crowding out potentially investment dollars. Now, 
it's really hard to prove this mathematically. Like you can't show the paper trail and say, oh, this is, a, but we have relationships. We can, we can show that the stock market has been fairly highly correlated to the combination of the Fed's balance sheet, the minus the treasury general account, right? Because when it's going down, it's helpful. When it's going up, it's negative. Minus the reverse repo. Now, the, I would say the counter argument to our view that this is going to drain liquidity is that the reverse repo is going to absorb all the treasury bill issuance because money markets will essentially buy those bills and then park it in the reverse repo. We're a little skeptical. We don't think it'll be one for one. We think it'll be more like one for two. But I think that is a debate. And we're in the camp that this is going to be a crowding out. Um, at a minimum, probably 200 billion. At a maximum, probably five to 600 billion. So that's actually some good news if you're listening to this from the, the, the viewpoint of a mortgage professional thinking about rates, because we know that there's going to be somewhere potentially about a trillion dollars of issuance, right? I mean, that's around the right number of based upon this. It's not going to happen immediately, but over time. So a trillion dollars of issuance. And the question is, what are they going to issue? I believe that the vast majority is two years or less. I think that that's what the target is. So while it doesn't directly compete with 10-year treasuries, you might say, okay, there's a lot that's coming to market. But what you're bringing up here is something of, of really good interest is that while it's a liquidity drain, maybe all that liquidity drain isn't on the bond market. Maybe the liquidity drain, there's a lot of participation from the stock market too. And that does not hurt long rates as much. Sure. I mean, I mean, look, there's no comparison between a treasury bill and a stock, right? I mean, like they're not the same at all. You could argue a 30-year bond or a 10-year bond has some similarities to a stock, right? I mean, different risk profile, but similar duration uh, can, can fill the asset side of your book in a similar way, okay? Um, I mean, look, nobody knows, right? I mean, but what I can tell you is that we've tracked this now for the last two or three years. And when the treasury general account is increasing, it tends to coincide with weaker stock markets, okay? Can I prove it? No. Um, is the relationship there? Yes. Hey, Diane, I wonder if you could pull up for us a chart that I'd love for, um, for Mike to opine on. And, uh, and that is a chart of either M2 or, or ODL, you know, other deposits and liabilities. And, you know, ODL takes out money markets and cash. Here's so uh, we've got... First. So, so uh, we, you've got the M2 there, but let's get the rate of change if you can, Diana, because I think this is pretty, pretty revealing uh, when you take a look at this chart. And a lot of people are looking at something like this, Mike. When you see a rate of change that's so dramatic and negative, uh, like you do have here, and I believe the last time it was this extreme, while we don't have it on the chart, was about 1930. If, you know, a bit, you know, what's your thoughts on how this has an impact? Well, I mean, I don't even need to go back. I mean, you, you've kept that chart up. You would see it every time it went negative, you're in a recession. Yeah. So like those shaded, bar, those shaded bars are recessions. And, you know, we're way more negative than we were in the early 70s, mid 70s, and early 80s. So, you know, that's the way I think about it. The way I think, of, and this is real M2, um, we tend to look at nominal. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that I think listeners might find interesting about that chart is this is why you have inflation. Okay, so remember in 2008, when uh, this is real again, but that's fine, it's just the same story. In, yeah, after I'm not 2000, up the M2 here, yeah. sorry, Mike. No, that's fine. Uh, how about, about, would ODL help you here, Mike? Or you want, you want to see what it is with the effect of inflation is what you want to see, right? No, this is good. No. You, you can just keep this up because it tells the same story. What I want to, what I want to talk about with listeners is the following. So after, after the GFC, the Fed did QE for the first time, right? And it was aggressive. And I and remember- G was, GFC for everybody, it's the great yeah. financial crisis. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the GFC is 08. And, and everybody's like, oh my God, we're gonna have inflation and all the gold bugs came out. It's like, it's gonna be terrible. And I remember like retail investors were like, no, we're gonna keep buying bonds. There's no inflation, I don't see it. And they were right. And the reason why is because in the- Great financial crisis, the QE that was employed, all it did was fill in holes on banks' balance sheets and consumer balance sheets who, you know, were, you know, basically lost their homes. So it didn't create new money. What it did was it was just, it sat on the reserves of the banks that used it to 
you know, shore themselves up. This time around, and that's why M2 never really got much above five, six percent. This time around, M2 went to 25 percent. Okay, mm -hmm. why? Because they printed the money and they actually sent checks to people to spend it. <laughs> so it's just the velocity of the money exploded. Okay, PPP program, you know, they sent checks to people. We at the time in April of 2020, you know, we wrote a note said, um, get ready for helicopter money. This is it. And go, by the way, get ready for inflation. And I remember people like laughing at us, throwing us out of the room, saying, you're out of your mind. We're going like, we're going into a depression. I'm like, no, we're going to have monster inflation. And then, of course, they did the extra, extra three fiscal stimuluses, one by the Republicans, two by the Democrats. So it was a bipartisan effort to get inflation and they got it. <laughs> and so here we are. And now, though, it's the opposite. So now you have a situation where the velocity of money is collapsing because you have a banking crisis in the regional banking system and the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet at a record pace. So now you have negative M2 growth. I think in the nominal terms, it's negative four, negative five. I mean, you know, that's your proxy for, uh, there it is, that's your proxy for nominal GDP. So like, this is why we're so out of consensus on earnings. We think there's going to be negative revenue growth now. So last year we had a earnings recession in you know a few areas: consumer discretionary, uh, technology, um, com services, you know the big internet advertisers, et cetera. Why? Because they they all overinvested, right? They all thought the pandemic boom was going to go on forever. You know this uh, the old story that the, the pandemic winners. You know there's only a few. Everybody won. Okay. And some companies actually mismanaged it. They said, oh, this is going to go on forever. So we're going to buy a bunch of capacity and inventory. And guess what? They, their costs got out of control. So now they're cutting costs. And everybody's you know, celebrating that, saying, oh, look at these companies. They already had the recession. They're cutting costs. It's all going to be good from here. Well, yes, if, the, if this is as bad as it gets on from a demand standpoint, that's true. But if we have a, now a disappointing revenue outcome, which is our view, then these companies haven't even begun to cut costs enough. And that's what we think is going to be the surprise of the second half of this year. But it all stems from the money supply um, overshoot. They overdid it. And now they're trying to withdraw this liquidity probably too quickly um, because there's so much pressure on them politically to get inflation down. And boy, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna get inflation down. I <laughs> mean, and they're gonna probably have a recession. Hey, Mike. I wanted to dig a little bit deeper on today's Fed meeting that we're going to be getting here at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You know, the expectations are for them to not hike. I think there's a lot of contemplation on whether the language is going to be skip or pause. You know, what are your feelings on what the Fed's going to do and what their language is going to be? Do you think that they're done from here? I know a lot of people out there like Peter Bookvar and Rosenberg think the Fed is done. And what do you think the impact is going to be on the bond market today? Well, I'll give the uh, I'll give the Jay Powell answer. It depends on the data. <laughs> I mean, but in all seriousness, I mean, I don't think it matters. Okay, meaning if you look at that chart we just had up, I mean, well, I mean, what do you think is going to happen next? Right. So, like, does it really matter? I don't think so. I think what matters now, once again, is the fiscal um, is going to matter a lot more. Like. This is our whole thesis, right? Is that once we went into the pandemic, we, we have now entered what I would call a fiscal dominant regime. Uh, we left the monetary dominant regime. The Fed's job, Fed, the Fed now only exists to fund the government. That's it, that's it. So whatever the government decides to spend, the Fed is obliged to help that out, to assist the treasury in funding whatever the government decides to spend, whether that's QE or whether that's keeping rates lower or whether that's maybe tightening at a certain time or whatever. And I just don't think monetary policy is going to be the main driver of kind of the economy or even markets from that standpoint, right? I just told you like over the last 12 months, I think that the reason why we've done better the last six months is because of the fiscal impulse, not because of what the Fed's doing. The Fed's been tightening for the most part until they did the, the depositor bailout. Okay, fine. So, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line for me is I think the Fed's going to pause today. Um, I think they may talk about keeping the door open. That's probably what they should do and be data dependent. But I don't think it matters for the stock market. I don't think, I think the stock market, what the stock market's going to tr 
going to key off of now is the treasury issuance, like what that's doing to liquidity and what are the fundamentals going to do in the second half? Is my earnings recession going to get called into work or are the bulls going to be right and we have a reacceleration in growth? So that's, I, just want to, yeah. I just want to kind of go over a couple of, it's so insightful, you know, a little scary, kind of reminds you of Banana Republic. You get the Fed being, you know, complicit in whatever you want to spend. It's, it's, it's a scary thought, but I mean, heck, you're right. Um, but you did well, say- well, well, before you, I, I, I mean, that's not really, I mean, I'm not really saying that the Fed is complicit in it. I'm just saying that they're not front and center anymore. Like we made the Fed into this like, you know, team of rock stars when they should really just be like a utility in the background doing nothing. I mean, it all started with, you know, Greenspan era and all these press conferences and talking like, that's not really what the Fed's supposed to be. The Fed's supposed to be in the background assisting the economy, not driving the economy. So yeah, that, right. I think in, in some ways it's a, it's a good development. I just don't think that the stock market understands that necessarily. Yeah, Bernanke th started off with being more transparent, right? So, so, but but you said a few things that I think are are, are really important here to understand. So, th this Treasury issuance is going to play a major role here, and it's going to drain liquidity. Now, under normal circumstances, with the change in the nominal M two or M two or ODL or whatever you want to look at. You know, these are clearly recessionary indicators. The big difference that you pointed out between the the 08 recession where we did have money getting injected in, that money was predominantly injected into banks, which was to some extent like pushing on a string because a lot of it never made it to the consumer. Here, we actually said, here's some money and go spend it, which I think you also use the term, it's kind of like a pulse effect, which is still out there. But the thing is, is that this did occur. I think the last one was March of 2021. And here we are a little over two years later. Do we still think that the pulse effect from this is, is palpable? I mean, is it something that, or, or should this not have, should this, shouldn't this have worn out by now? I mean, I know, notice credit cards have skyrocketed in the balances that people have had. So people, and they've also, we've seen the savings rate go from 10% to, to uh, 5% or four and change percent. When does this end? When do we run out of this? Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is the stock versus the flow argument, right? So we injected all this money into basically consumer balance sheets and small businesses, by the way. What do they do with that money? They put it into banks. So deposits exploded. And then a few banks, you know, made the bad decision of buying long duration bonds and blew up. Okay, fine. But you know those deposits are still there because they, you know those deposits didn't, didn't disappear, right? They got they got saved by the FDIC. So those deposits are still there. Now they've we've started to see people spend those deposits down, okay? And uh, but they're still probably we think somewhere between a trillion and a trillion and a half dollars of excess savings from the stimulus. The question is how concentrated are those savings now? Meaning. Low and mid end are starting to hurt. We see that data. Um, low end retailers, and you know, we're seeing mid guys trade down. So I, I think the low end's tapped out already. The mid, the middle, middle end consumers probably tapped out because they know they better save whatever they got left because inflation's higher. And then we have to inflation adjust the savings. So if you think about the average household goods purchases over a course of a year. My guess is the inflation, like the basket of those goods, you know, which includes rent and cars and clothes and food and everything else, probably up 40% from pre-pandemic levels, maybe 30. So we got to adjust it for that. And then what that does to the psychology of the consumer. Look, we think ultimately that that's going to expire this, like now. I mean, like, like even if a consumer has that extra dough, they're probably going to hold, like they're not going to be out spending it the way that they were. And we're seeing it in the data too. We're seeing it in the survey data that we do. We're seeing it in spending patterns. Does that mean a recession is imminent? No, it just means that it's not going to be the, the force. The, but, but then the other driver, as we talked about earlier, was the fiscal spend over the last year, which really went into the Inflation Reduction Act, which is an industrial boom. That's why those industrial companies continue to do okay. They're seeing real demand from that subsidy in those programs. The moratorium on student loans which is a direct consumer subsidy, which is about to go away uh, in August. Okay, that's a big deal. And of course, the food stamp program, the supplemental nutrition program, 
right? That already expired. And that's really crushing low end households right now. Um, so it's a very, it's a real tale of two worlds. Low end consumer is probably already in a recession, even before a labor cycle, particularly relative to the way they were spending. Okay. High end is just sort of saying, you know what, it's not so great anymore. It's just take it easy on the crazy expenses. And the middle end is trading down. Uh, That's well, let's, let's talk about something that could impact that. And, you know, when, when, um, on, on, I think it was the, uh, the 8th of March, when SVB situation just kind of blew up, um, you know, our dear friend, Peter Bookfar was always, you know, very insightful. Immediately, the first thing he said, this is going to create a credit crunch. I remember he went on CNBC and, and Jim Cramer, who clearly didn't understand it, you know, started to, to like make some nasty comments to Peter. I mean, it's, it's a shame because Peter was so smart and Cramer just doesn't get it. But talk about that because you're a lot closer to it than we are. We know anecdotally from what we're seeing that banks are pulling back and there's a credit crunch. But I think you have a really good line of sight to how how impactful a credit crunch is happening and, and what, what you see the longer term impact of this being. I mean, yeah, like, like my reaction on the weekend that Silicon Valley failed, my, the first note I wrote was credit crunch. That, that's my initial reaction. Now, our bank's team um, reminded me correctly that it takes time. Um, that there are lines of credit that are extended to customers. Okay, now remember, only three banks went out. Right, it wasn't like about like now they will start like the, the the lending standards were already tight as of January before the bank failures. They're continuing to tighten, but they're not getting progressively tight. They're already very tight. Um, but it takes time for you know the credit creation kind of cycle to go down. Now we did get a real downtick in credit demand in the May release of the senior loan officer report. Okay. So what I think is, so if you look at our forecast our, and our banks analysts have been pretty good about this, they said, look, we think credit growth will stay positive on a year over year basis until probably the fourth quarter, and then it will go negative. And I think that's right. Although I would argue it maybe gets pulled forward a quarter. Okay, particularly if they, we don't know what the regulatory changes are going to be yet for the regional banks or even the SIFI banks are talking about raising capital standards there. So that's going to come out this summer and that may accelerate it a little bit. But either way, we think credit growth will be negative year over year by the fourth quarter at the latest. And that, you know, you know what that means slower growth and probably recession. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, Mike, I, I think that um, when we when we take a look at, um, I'm just looking at some of these questions too um, that that are coming through. Your thoughts on the 10 year, and you know, I'm not going to ask you to to translate it to mortgage rates necessarily, but but what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that there's a good chance of even without a recession, just fundamentally, latter part of the year, 50 basis points less than the 10 year, and with a recession. I mean, who knows, but definitely even deeper than that, right? So, yeah, I guess for those of you that are listening and answering the question, wondering about it, because I know it's near and dear to you. Um, so, so Mike kind of sees it the same way we do. We see lower rates, you know, eventually fundamentals hopefully will take over. Um, we do have some extraordinary selling from banks trying to, trying to raise capital. But I know, Dan, you had another question as well. Well, what are you seeing there on that banking side? Because one of the things that's been hurting, you know, the long end and, and mortgage-backed securities in the 10 years is banks having to sell some of those assets to come up with depositors money that's fleeing for some better options that were created by the Fed hiking so aggressively. You know, are you seeing that kind of stabilize a bit and some of that selling pressure ease up? And do you think that we're kind of out of the woods with this banking crisis? Or if the Fed were to skip and hike again, do you maybe see, you know, some additional pressure there, maybe additional banks failing? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the duration um, crisis is probably over at least with the major banks i mean i think at this point we would have seen like that seems to be pretty contained plus you know the fdic and the fed stepped in pretty quickly at the win and, and look the the banks that are in trouble are still drawing at the window mm -hmm. but it's stable now you know doesn't mean it's gone away they still need those reserves and those are expensive reserves by the way um the deposit betas have gone up um and they're going to stay high until the front end gets lowered um, so look, we think it, it all it all it all ends up in the same place. Okay, 
which is credit creation is going to dry up. Um, the best case outcome is we have a, a slowdown that doesn't lead to a credit um, sort of crisis, meaning that these assets, like we have, a, like right now it's a duration issue, not a credit issue. There's bad credits out there, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's no forced selling of bad credits right now. Now the refinancing cycle for office really doesn't begin in earnest till next year. And then there's gonna be five big years in a row. So I think that's when like the credit event of this particular cycle, it takes a while. Like it's probably gonna be a 24, 25, 26 issue for office. Will there be some other implications? Like, is there other bad credit areas out there? Probably, um, you know, and I guess, my guess is a lot of companies will be exposed in the earnings recession in the second half of this year, it'll be like, we're, we're on pace right now for record bankruptcies. Think about that. Yeah, wow. And, and so you're saying next year on the commercial real estate for office probably starts to show some some exposure there too. And right now it's, it's mostly anticipation, but with realization of it probably starts next year. That's right. And, and, and but what the, I, think what, you know, I think what Dan's asking is, is this turned into a systemic crisis? I don't think so. Hmm. This feels a lot like the 1980s SNL problem and for the same reasons by the way rates went up too fast and it took 12 years it's just it, like these it's like extend and pretend like the, the deals will get done it's a crowding out issue yeah you know? i think i think another point that dan was was uh was trying to get for the benefit of those that are they're listening to is that you know we're battling here trying to see rates come down and maybe one of the things that's propping them up is some extraordinary selling by banks that are in a position of saying hey look I'm trying to raise capital because deposits are fleeing into money markets. I really can't go to the person I gave the car loan, home equity line to, and pull that back on them, or the commercial loan can't pull that back. So my only choice is the investments I made in long-term treasuries to, although I loathe doing it, to try and sell those to raise capital. And, right. uh, and by, by doing so, uh, that extraordinary selling that comes into the marketplace you know, battles what we're seeing and, you know, more supply causes. Do you think that that's essentially, most of that is in the rear view mirror? Well, I mean, it's ongoing. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess the way I come out on it is, and it wasn't clear is that I think the the real stress pressure of that, like the market can absorb some of that supply, right? There's always demand, inherent demand for long duration, high quality, you know, treasury bonds. Um, so I think right now it feels stable. Could it get worse again? Perhaps. I, I think there'll be more. I think what I think what it really will do is it'll truncate how low can rates get on the downside, even in a recessionary outcome, because there's going to be there is supply at lower levels where banks can get whole on perhaps some of those bad purchases that they made, closer to three yeah. percent. Yeah. And before I asked you about stocks, um, you know, the spread between mortgages and treasuries. Uh, has widened rather significantly by at least 100 basis points above the normal spreads that we've seen. Some of that clearly is the fact that the servicing value is is has diminished greatly because I think the smart money is saying, "Hey, rates are going to come down, so therefore the servicing value uh, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be as high due to the fact that these loans will be refinanced, so there'll be a much more shorter uh, lifespan on collecting servicing fees." But it's probably more than that. Is is there a fear that the difference between credit quality has expanded and that's causing the spread to go to go to these more extreme levels? Well, I think it's a combination of things you've brought up already, which is that I think there is a concern that there, I mean, and by the way, there has been supply of mortgages from, from banks. Okay. The question is nobody knows how much. So there's just like, it's people, there's not as much appetite to be the first one in the pool. Let's see how this goes credit investors tend to be a bit more skeptical than obviously equity investors, you know, they're not going to run right back into the fire um, immediately. So it's going to be a little bit of a cat and mouse game, but ultimately, you know, I do think these mortgages will be funded because they're generally decent credits. You know, I mean, for the most part, this is not, yeah, they, I want good make, credits. Yeah, I want to make it clear. Like this is not a way where you had 5% loan to value loans. These are, 20 to 30 percent loan to value in some cases 50 percent because asset prices have gone up you know i think the, i think one of the interesting developments too is that people are kind of stuck in their homes now that they can't really move because they can't afford to move because they got to get a mortgage that's twice as expensive so what does that do to supply of more like in other words there's no turnover going on either right you yeah, guys that's why the feds, the feds balance sheet 
runoff has not been even right. near its targets on, on mortgage-backed securities. I mean, but the people on this call are good enough. They're going to use some debt consolidation tools to kind of, because people are paying are paying high debts on their other things like credit cards and car loans and home equity lines of credit. So they're blended rate. But that's a different story. That's the, the people on this call will be able to solve for their customers. I want to ask you about stocks. Could you do some math back of the napkin in your head where you're seeing, let's say, the S&P should be, not just the, you know, what, what, where it is like, how do you get there based upon the calculations that you would go through to say, here's where you think earnings come in, here's the multiple you'd apply, and here's what the S and P should be. Yeah, so I mean, we're, this is where I mean, we're very disciplined on price because that's how you, you know, when you have to steward four trillion dollars, you, you know, you, you can't be trading it. You, know, you have to try to enter at good prices and then, you know, not sell at bad times or take profits when it is good times to sell. And I would say right now on a you know, valuation adjust, risk adjusted basis right now, this is one of the worst markets I've seen in quite a while. Um, and, and the way we measure that is twofold. So number one, multiples are a function of two inputs. One is 10-year treasury yields, your risk-free rate. The other is equity risk premium. And the bear market last year was almost 100%, actually it was, it was 100% related to higher discount rate had nothing to do with equity risk premium. Equity risk premium actually went down over the course of 2022, even though you know, risks on growth increased at times during last year. So in other words, the equity market at no time over the last 12 months is really worried about growth in a meaningful way enough to price it into the equity risk premium. Today, that equity risk premium is actually down to 150 basis points. And I think the fair value for equity risk premium in a higher inflationary environment is probably closer to two 200, but in a world where your earnings risk is so significant, that equity risk premium should probably be closer to 400. So we're so far off from what I would consider a fat pitch on valuation, meaning I think the S&P 500 multiple, given the earnings risk that we see, should be about 14 times, which is an equity risk premium of call it 350 and a 10-year treasury yield at 375. That would be fair value given our view on earnings. You can do the math on what that means for S&P 500. Now, it won't stay there very long because when you get a fat pitch, money comes in. Like us, we'll, we'll be buying aggressively, okay? And so if I look out 12 months and what I think the, earning, what I think the earnings are going to be and where, where, where a reasonable multiple should be, which is like 16 to 18 times in a normalized earnings environment, then we're talking about 4,000-ish. Like the, the fair market value for the S and P over a twelve month period is probably four thousand, maybe forty two hundred. Okay, so we're we're trading above that today. It's it's expensive, you know, particularly when I can get five and a quarter percent on a T bill. So you know, but markets don't trade in a straight line, and it doesn't mean we're going to crash. It doesn't mean that we have to go down to three thousand because maybe the market doesn't give us a fat pitch. I don't know. But I can tell you this, as an equity allocator, or as an asset allocator, I, I feel no pressure whatsoever to allocate more dollars to the U.S. equity market at current prices. Now, that doesn't mean there's no stocks that I wouldn't want to buy. It just means at the asset level, at the S&P level, NASDAQ, even Russell, I mean, they're all pretty expensive. Sticking with the stocks, the AI craze, does it remind you or worry you that it's somewhat reminiscent of what we had seen um, before the dot-com bubble? Well, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I would say on one hand, it's exciting because this is what we're going to need for the next boom, right? In other words, our next boom story, which we still feel good about if we have the bust, is there will be like, what do we have to look forward to then? Uh, an investment cycle in a lot of different things, green energy, traditional energy infrastructure, reshoring, AI. These are all potentially enhancers to productivity, which means higher earnings growth, lower, you know, controllable inflation, not, you know, 2%, but controllable, manageable inflation. And that's the next boom. So on one hand, I, I think it's kind of exciting because now I can see how this will play into that cycle. The problem I have with it is, is that it ain't happening this year. Like, okay, some of the investment's gonna happen this year, but that's a cost. Not like we're not gonna see the benefit of this for at least two years, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit in 24. And some companies will benefit, but not the whole economy. So um, in that sense, 
it's very much like the late 1990s because the internet was also a massive driver of productivity. The difference is by the time you get to the late 90s, we were already seeing the benefits of that product. Like the investment in the internet started in 95. And if you remember, the market was really sluggish in 94, 95, and 96. It wasn't until 97, 98, 99 that it really took off. And that's when productivity increased from the investment we had made in the internet. Um, so we're in the 94, 95 period now for investing in all this stuff. And I think there will be a payoff down the road, but I, I'm not willing to pay for it today in a way that some people are. And hey, shame on me, because I, I could have made a lot more money if I was willing to throw caution to the wind and, and buy some of this stuff. So, you know, but that's my job. My job is to be more disciplined and I'm trying to keep people from doing bad things, right? At the wrong time. If you have a model that works, no model works 100%. So if you switched your model every time, you'd have no model, right? So you have to, you have to be, uh, you know, we started off with uh, kind of like that Michael Burry kind of analogy. You know, uh, look, I, I believe, uh, Mike, that you're going to be proven right. Um, it, it's, it's just eventually, and I don't think you're going to be off that much from a time perspective either. So I, I believe you're going to be proven right. Um, you're extraordinarily gracious. Mike, one of the first lessons I learned many, many, many moons ago, boy, more years than I want to admit to, is uh, I was a young guy and uh, someone teaching me about the markets. His name was Jack Grummet. And he said, you know, Barry, I always look at something and it's like the rule of 20. And I don't know if you ever heard of this. He said, sure. I, I take uh, the Fed funds rate, you know, I subtract it from 20. And that's about where the PE should be. Um, and, and, you know, it's really not that far off of what you said, right? So that would be about 15 by today's standards. And you're saying about 14 would be the next time you want to get in with a fat pitch, maybe a little earlier than that. So I think maybe Jack's advice wasn't too far off. No, I mean, and by the way, last October, when we got bullish, it was 15.5 times. It was close enough. And we had some technical indicators that told us it was time. So it was good. And that's, and that's what we try to do. And Obviously, we don't get it all right. And this year, we it's a good example of that. Um, but we're not going to abandon our process because that has worked so well over time. Well, Mike, um, we've had 1,200 people live join here um, who I think are all grateful. But let me tell you, no one's more grateful than 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 all of us here at, at MBS Highway. You know, um, Diana and Dan and Megan and myself. Your time is extraordinarily valuable, and it's such a premium. Um, we are in your debt and we are grateful for all the wisdom that you've shared and the kindness that you've shown and uh and sharing your genius with us so uh so we we truly truly appreciate you and know that we're in your corner if there's anything that uh that we could ever do to repay you seeing in the chat all the thank yous coming in to you mike i'm telling you these are we're so proud of these wonderful subscribers that we have that are really family members they're brilliant they really care they want to do a great job and they're always trying to learn. And you could see the outpouring of, of gratitude towards you. So thank you, Mike. Great. Glad to hear it. Glad to be helpful to anybody who wants to listen to, uh, to me make up stories. So um, <laughs> and I look forward to reading your stuff as well. So thanks, Barry. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thank you, Mike. Mike. Any, any, any last, last words before we, before we end it? I didn't want to give, give, not give you the opportunity, Megan and, and uh, Dan. We covered a lot. I'm soaking it up. <laughs> All right. Well, Mike, thank you. Thank you, brother. Really appreciate you. Hi, right, guys. Hi, everyone. We appreciate you guys. Everybody. God bless you all. Thank you.